Tech Cocktail Sessions, educational and inspirational talks from experienced startup founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. Um, just for you guys, uh, in case uh, you don't know what we do, ClearSpring is a company that's actually headquartered in McLean. We have offices in New York, LA, Chicago, Detroit, Atlanta, and San Francisco. Um, we were the first and actually one of the big propagators of that whole widget thing, if you guys remember it. Um, and as Frank said, we leveraged that um, widget sharing and tracking platform to grow into a generic sharing and tracking platform. Our core platform is Add This, and it's now used by 9 million websites. We reach about a billion unique users every month, um, and process about 20 terabytes every single day, or I'm sorry, 10 terabytes every day. So it's about a Library of Congress every week, and we parlayed that into a fairly large data business um, where we help advertisers um, target um, brands online socially. So anyway, enough about us. That's as much as I'll talk about. So uh, I'm going to try to go actually fairly quickly. Um, I'd love to get questions from you guys. Uh, I think it's more fun that way. And um, the topic is building momentum. I think it's a really important thing uh, for startups in particular. So how many of you guys have companies that you're, you've started? OK, that's really good. Um, the hardest thing, and, and I remember this, and I've worked with a couple startups, and I'm on the board of a couple startups, is you're starting at zero, right? So um, I'm an engineer by trade. I always start with math. And when you look at momentum, the equation is pretty simple, right? You need mass and velocity, right? So at the beginning of a startup, you don't have any mass. And that's a critical issue, right? You're one guy, two guys, whatever. Um, so at the beginning stages, speed really, really matters. Um, and this isn't just you know, a cute physics equation. It's actually one of the most important things that you hear all the time. Um, you hear it in different truisms like rapid iteration and all these other things. The real question is, how do you, how do you start moving fast, right? So in particular, I've worked on online businesses. Um, that's where I've invested. That's where I've worked. Um, and one of the things that I've always told entrepreneurs, if at all possible, uh, is ride the wave, right? And again, a lot of these things are going to be trite. But if you can do them, they work really, really well. So an example of riding the wave in our case, for instance, was when ClearSpring started and we were funded in 2006, social networks were really picking up in heat. Um, you may even remember a company called MySpace. How many of you guys still have MySpace profiles? Right? I mean, you're laughing, but uh, I'm going to use that example later on about how important momentum is. And you know, it's, it can hurt you on the way up, uh, down as much as it can help you on the way up. It's a powerful force, and it needs to be managed. So when you're starting from zero, there's already an existing force out there, right? Waves are natural occurrences. They happen in the tech space often. Um, there's multiple different waves, right? It's not just about social. There are subwaves and everything else. That's a pretty high energy source, right, to pick up velocity. And so again, in our case, we use social. Um, in, in a number of other cases, when you look at it, um, for instance, Buddy Media. Uh, how many of you guys know Buddy Media? They're one of the largest um, management tools for fan pages, which Facebook fan pages are now one of the biggest ways to communicate with your clients. Buddy rode the whole Facebook wave and said, they went into clients and said, hey, uh, you guys want to manage your presence on Facebook? Everyone says yes, right? That's an easy way to get in. But they had nobody. So again, it's, it's a lot easier to get in. Now, <clears throat> when you're thinking about getting into clients, and I'm using a B2B example here in particular, let's say your clients are publishers, let's say they're advertisers, let's say they're small businesses, you have, if you get this wave and you come in, it's a lot easier because at the beginning you usually don't have a product, right? You don't have a huge ROI case. It's really you, a hope and a dream, right? Maybe a little bit. And so that's why that wave is so important because a lot of times if people aren't actually um, you know, coming with a hard ROI case, they just want to learn about what this hot new thing is, so that's your chance. Now let's assume you get in there. The next stage is to arm influencers. And you hear this a lot, influencers, influencers, early adopters. I can't stress enough how important this is. It was very important in our business. It's been important in every single business. So in the case of MySpace, again, right? Um, MySpace actually was very good at this at the beginning. And their influencers were the musicians, right? And that seeded their community. So they got all of these musicians to come onto their platform. That attracted you know, all of us, because we're fanboys. and. We want to go out there and talk to musicians. Oh my God, I friended Dr. Dre. Great. You know, um, that was a big deal, right? Facebook quickly figured out we're not actually friends with Dr. Dre and built fan pages, but I thought it was friends with Dr. Dre. Um, but that's incredibly important, right? Other examples of those successes are 
Twitter, they did a great job with the celebrities. I mean, how many times do we have to hear about Ashton Kutcher and how many followers he has, right? But that drummed up interest and support, and those influencers um, seeded the whole community. Again, took that energy from the wave. You're arming them. And remember when you're arming them, what you really want to do is help them think different, be different. Um, that's what they want to be. They want to be the guys who are at the leading edge, right? I want to be the first guy on this platform. Um, so take that wave, take that trend, package it, and give it to the influencer so they can go out and proselytize it and make, them, make it their own. So this is the part that I think is critical for startups that you often miss. So a lot of people focus on the external side of momentum, right? The PR, the marketing, and what have you. Um, what I'd love for you guys to take away from this, if there's one simple message, is bring that external momentum, however small, back home. And this is a loop, right? Because the people that are going to be the biggest advocates for your company are your employees. Even if it's just you, right? Even if it's just your buddy, even if it's whoever. Um, so in the early days of ClearSpring, for instance, our momentum was, okay, how many different publishers are using our platform? How many different unique users? So we constantly tracked that. And every time the unique users went up, right, it was a big deal, right? In particular, when there was massive movement. So um, when we started um, and introduced our platform, I guess it was 2006, 2007, we were talking in, okay, I don't know, tens of thousands of developers, and we were talking in terms of um, millions of uniques, right? We've gone from zero to a billion. We've gone from tens of thousands to nine million. And it's so important to keep those numbers and keep bringing it back and bring that into a loop because if people don't understand what success is internally and people don't understand um, you know, the fact that you're actually winning, um, you actually lose momentum internally, right? So again, it's, it's a cycle. Next thing, double down. So um, that's pretty funny, right? Actually, that was, that was one of our developers. I'm not that cute. Um, so one of the things that you know, you'll notice about companies that go through this hyper growth curve, companies that are really successful, they start out positioning against a wave. They successfully enable these influencers. And then once they enable these influencers and bring that home, everyone's kind of excited. And all of a sudden, things are moving really fast. And then they stop, right? It's like deer in headlights. Um, this is incredibly common, believe it or not, um, because the companies themselves are not actually structured to double down. Uh, or they lose focus. And this is hard. Uh, I've, I know I've been using MySpace, but it's a pretty good um, example. So those guys did a great job in terms of the wave, right? They were in the middle of a hot trend. They definitely hit the influencer marketing. They were growing like a weed. But I think this is where um, they really stopped. And this is where Facebook came after them, and they didn't double down. So what happened is they exited, and after they exited and sold their company to News Corp, MySpace kind of focused more on the money and more on the ads than they did on users. Now, look, at the end of the day, they were pretty big, right? I think at the time they were 130, 150 million users. That's a lot, right? But that point in the industry, that was the wrong time to double down, and I think Facebook has proven that because now they're at 700 million, right? So in the social networking game, that was too early. So you have to know when to double down, when to keep pushing on the right metrics. The final thing, um, and this is perhaps the most important thing that I could tell you, uh, as you're going in and you're talking to, your, to the external constituents and you're talking to employees, you're talking to everyone else, in the early stages when you're building momentum, the external perception is actually pretty powerful rocket fuel for internal motivation, right? People are building things, you're getting some traction against the product. But the single most important thing that you can do as an entrepreneur is focus on the business model. Because that business model, right, and what those key metrics are, they're gonna determine how you communicate with the market, and they're gonna determine how you communicate internally with the employees. So when you look at Facebook, for example, right, even though I think people were skeptical of the model, which was ultimately display advertising, their core metrics and their core mission stayed the same, right? They were always trying to increase the number of counts on there, and they were monetizing it via display inventory, right? So they could steady drumbeat, communicate that externally, and internally they could do the same thing. When you have that same, I'll call it um, symmetrical communication to both internal and external constituents, it's a really powerful tool to keep leveraging the momentum up because communication is important in doing that. So with that, 
Um, I wanted to stop because I actually prefer just questions and answers, and you can ask me whatever you want. And uh, Austin, what's up? That's my co-founder. Anyone? Yes. I think so. Is that okay? Can they just ask, or do you have a microphone on? Jen's going to come by. Uh, you make a good point about influencers, but it seems like nowadays with Facebook and Twitter, they've, um, and Facebook has shown this by pretty much going to any business that works. Um, what opportunities do you see still exist for influencers, such as like, I mean, Quora now is trying to go after the experts, but for startups in general, um, where do you see some opportunities in regards to now attracting them? Because a lot of them want to go for broadcast mediums, and it seems like those exist now. So is the question, what oppor business opportunities are there to target influencers, or? Yeah. Um, honestly, I think that it's always there. I don't think it's ever going to go away. And it really depends on the product and the vertical. So um, you know, in MySpace's case, they tip musicians, because at the beginning, there was really a platform for promotion for musicians. Quora is trying to target experts to see the community, because those experts, in turn, are going to promote and um, bring people in to view the content they produce. But I mean, if you look at um, anything social, for that matter, um, even look at like uh, like the Uber suite of products, right? Um, Ecofon and all those other things, they're promoted by the fact that these high-end people are using them. And then on Twitter, it says, you know, attributed to Ecofon. It's like, oh, okay, that's that's a cool version of it that this really high-end guy has it. So I just think it really depends on vertical. And I would I wouldn't think to yourself like influencer market is cornered. My point really was that. You want to hit the, the people that are influential in any given vertical they're at, um, because those people are just powerful, powerful advocates. Apple is a company that their entire brand is built around marketing influencers, nothing else. And then everyone wants to, you know, all of a sudden you see everyone with white earbuds, right? Does that make sense? Can you talk a little more about the double down moment? Yeah. Um, so, in, in our context, for instance? Yeah, in your context. Sure. Um, well, this, this is important, right? Because one of the things is uh, that investors will often tell you is follow the money. Um, so there's a number of different signals that'll tell you whether to double down. But when you have customer attraction, right, and you can see that that's a repeatable um, model, right? So let's say for, in, so double down, for instance, let's say that you hit like three or four key customers in the case of um, a B2B business, right? But you know that the thing that you've done for them actually will work for multiple people. Hit the pedal to the metal. Um, to be put into mathematical terms, the best time, the very best time, and Groupon and Living Social have done a brilliant job of doing this, um, is once you understand exactly what the value of the customer is, and you know exactly how much it costs you to acquire that customer, in particular in online businesses, I mean, if the acquisition cost is just a little less or even close to um, the cost that, or the value of the customer, then you just you know, go after it. And what you're seeing actually online is there's a whole class of businesses, Groupon, Living Social, Guilt Group, I mean, you can go on and on. They're very simple. They're based on this principle that they've quickly established how much the customer's worth, and they're masters of customer acquisition. So I think that's actually a huge skill to learn if you're an online business. Does that help? Widgets to add this. Was it a, a gradual movement? Was it a shower moment? Was it a strategic napkin moment? Can you describe it? Strategic. It was all of the above, I think. Um, I, I, I mean, I can give you the elegant version of the story, which the PR people gave me, or I can give you the messy version, which would be several beers, but I'll give you the in between because of time constraints. Um, I think what we recognized quickly was that widget sharing and tracking, right? was not going to be enough for the publishers. And that simple realization woke us up and say, wow, there's this company that's doing something simpler, and they're just doing link sharing, right? And basically, publishers don't care if it's a widgets or videos or whatever. They just want to connect to these social networks. And that realization sparked you know, this investigation that prompted us to go in this direction of add this. The actual shift and change, first, we really we ripped out all of the code for the original add this and made sure that we thought it was uh, pretty good. And then once we had a ton of momentum behind it, then we downshifted our original platform and tried to move people over. And that was about a 12-month process. Can you, in that situation, describe the impact to your customers and how 
how you transition them to something you first got them to believe in. Yeah. And then you kind of woke up one day and said, ha ha, joke's on you, you're going to now want to do this. The ha ha, joke's on you thing doesn't work, actually. Um, but <laughs> what, we, uh, what we did, and that was really tough. That's an awesome question, actually. So the way that we positioned it was that we view ourselves as partners with the customers. Our job was to you know, navigate them through this ecosystem. Start with the we, we want your mutual success scenario. And once you both establish that, then you say, look, this is where the market is heading. Do you agree or disagree? Um, the key, I think, with those situations is very open communication. You try to give them ample time to switch over, ample rationale, and make it as easy as possible. But you should also make it easy for them to leave you and not make, you know, make it seem like you're holding them hostage. So we had you know, various ramp down paths for different people, but most of our very, very big publishers um, transitioned very quickly. And those who didn't um, consciously transition actually started using Ad This anyway by accident. So it was, it was a nice, it, it actually worked out pretty well mathematically for us. When you talk about riding the wave, usually when there's a wave, there's already established players who have kind of leading the wave. My space in your example, so for the newcomer or the disruptor, isn't it, I mean, how do you, how do you handle the one who's already established? How do you think, do you think MySpace failed because they made bad decisions or there was a better disruptor? So, um, do you want, I'll repeat the last question, which I think is the, do, you, do I think MySpace failed because there were, they failed to ride the wave or there was a better disruptor? Um, let me see if I can answer that in a short way. The shortest way to answer that, I think, um, is I think MySpace failed because they fundamentally didn't understand the nature of the wave that was occurring. The wave that was occurring, I th and it's still occurring, is that there is going to be an infrastructure, right, a social platform for the entire web. MySpace fundamentally positioned and viewed themselves as a media company that made money off display advertising, that did entertainment and everything else. And Facebook was deadly focused on everyone on the planet using it and, and every website. Right, and that was, I think, I mean, when we were starting early on, we had to fight to get, you know, applications, to get widgets, anything installed on MySpace. They want us to pay them at points. I mean, y it was like war to get onto MySpace. Facebook was the exact opposite. And I think um, that right there shows the difference in terms of philosophy. Facebook was a platform that they were trying to enable an ecosystem, and MySpace was a media company. So, and I think those positions were fundamentally due to, Facebook saw something bigger occurring out on the web, and they could be the center of it. Anyone else? I'm calling on everyone in the front. How, um, how often did you review your metrics as far as like a strategic revamp? Like how often would you look at the metric and say, oh, we're really following the right metric? Um, so now, I mean, it's funny, when it's revisionist history, right? It's, it's really easy to say that you know, we're metrics driven and everything else. I think you try your best as a startup to pick the right metrics. Um, now, I can tell you what we do now. Um, we have weekly dashboards which encapsulate the entire business. We look for key trends changing. Um, and basically, I would say, if you see anything changing in the macro system, right, then you go ahead and revisit your metrics to see if you're reading it the right way. Um, but in the web space, honestly, I mean, I would say a minimum, at the minimum, every single month, you have to look at it and just make sure you're fundamentally you know, not missing anything. Um, doesn't mean you change your strategy. What I've noticed is roughly every year or two, you're going to have to make some big moves, like certain new products, certain changes, things like that. Seems in our business have occurred, um, but the sp social space is messed up, so you have to always be <laughs> leery. I think as long as you're increasing your measurements, though, um, uh, one one quick point. Sorry, I'm babbling here, but we say this in our design, and I say this in our business. So you don't build a UI strictly based on data. There's this data-driven philosophy. Right, where you say, all right, whatever the data says, like, you know, we're gonna change this pixel, move this up, you're gonna be blind, right? You just keep changing it. Sometimes you have to step back and say, okay, hold on, wait a minute. There's, there's a macro trend, there's something I'm missing here. The data is actually guiding me to a local minima. If you look up, it's like, okay, the curve goes like this. There's actually a bigger hill up here, and we're just focused on this little hill. The same thing applies for business. We're trying to be a data informed business, not data driven. I think data driven leads to, like, you know, you might be driving yourself down a hole. I really like the presentation. Um, so, you know, what I got out of it is that the only way to view growth is to measure progress. What is your single indicator of progress for you? Revenue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, revenue. 
I, and I would advise that you start with that. The, the one thing that I think businesses don't, I mean, the one thing I see that businesses don't do well is, especially online, and, and look, we're, everyone does this at a stage. It's like, oh, you know, investors don't get it. They don't get it. You know, once this product is big, I can make money a million ways. How? So I think that the key is to build a thesis-driven business and say, okay, if this is true, when we get radical reach, we could build a media business through advertising. If it's not radical reach, we'll do a subscription business and they're ex-customers. If you can start with that thesis early and constantly be iterating and tuning that thesis until it's an actual model, that's important. So I guess what I'm saying is don't necessarily be driven by revenue, but always keep it in your mind and build towards it because, it, I mean, even Facebook is doing that, right? You just have to be building towards a model because, I mean, we're here to build businesses, right? If revenue is paid traction, and if you're building a platform type business, do you exchange one for the other, or is it a dual momentum environment, right? So you talk about MySpace, which is focused on revenue. Facebook took a different strategy, but it's like one brand. Mm -hmm. um, I would say you're, what's your ultimate, re you sit back and say what market do you want to win, right? So. If Facebook was like, look, if I want, I want to, every single person on the planet, they wanted to win the communication space, right? MySpace was trying to win media dollars, right? And so their strategic driver was being the best advertising, you know, hyper-targeting and winning market share in the display advertising space versus Facebook was trying to win market share in the social communication space, which once they built that platform, now they can disrupt display, commerce, whatever. Um, so... The only reason I would say pay attention to your platform over revenue is if your short-term revenue isn't consistent with your long-term revenue goals. Does that make sense? Like you can do stuff to make money at the beginning, but just know that you're doing that because ultimately if you win this platform adoption X, then you'll get like a gajillion dollars. Does that make sense? It always still goes down to revenue. It's just which revenue do you want to win? A minute ago you were talking about the looking at analytics um, in terms of your website performance and maybe website redesign What's your view on the role of the designer, um, like Leslie was talking about earlier? Uh, how would you cast the design, how would you weight the design visions versus analytics? Ooh, that's tough. Um, I would say that in our company, at least, and in my personal opinion, the new designers have to be good at analytics. That, I mean, it's, it's again, uh, we believe in the data-informed version of the world, so, if, they're not, if you don't have a designer who's always asking you what is the, like, you know, so let's say you have an interface. What is the one thing that you want that interface to do really, really well, and what are the maximum three metrics, but what is the one metric you want to get to get accomplished? So on addthis.com, when you go to that, the absolute number one thing is get the code, period, the end. So we try our best to maximize it. So our bounce rate is as high as possible, right? We don't want people to hang out there. We want them to, like, leave. Um, so if you're designers, are not cognizant of that goal, and then at least, you know, smart enough to kind of work through analytics. I feel like that's the next generation. Um, even in, if you look at ad creative, anything in agencies, everyone's moving towards that. Um, so it's a unique opportunity, I think, for people who are in design. It's actually our last question for the session. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs>